Hi everyone, thanks for being tuned. I am Mathieu Favas, the Economist Finance Correspondent, uh, and I cover banking, trade finance, fintech, and a few other financial topics uh, for the paper. It's my great pleasure today to have the chance to speak to uh, Barry Auburn of HSBC about the bank's plans to achieve net zero. Barry runs global commercial banking at HSBC, a role to which he was formally appointed uh, a little more than a year ago, after assuming, an, uh, after assuming it on a, an interim basis since August 2019. Uh, commercial banking is a key business, of course, for HSBC. It serves about 1.4 million customers across 53 markets, ranging from small enterprises focused on their home markets through to corporates operating internationally. Barry, welcome to Sustainability Week, and thank you for being with us. It's great, Matthew. It's great. I'm delighted to be with you today. So HSBC has pledged to achieve net zero in their own operations and supply chain by 2030. They have also pledged to align finance emissions from their portfolio and from customers uh, to the Paris Agreement goal of net zero by 2050. Uh, and this conversation will zoom in on how they plan to achieve both. And we'll start with the first target, so net zero across operations by the end of this decade, uh, which obviously is actually pretty soon. Uh, so, so first of all, Barry, um, I'd be interested to know how you came up with this target. Uh, why 2030? Yeah, so I think... Um... Climate and sustainability have always been critically important subjects for the for the bank, Matthew. And we played a lead role in this space for quite a few years. And the thing is, we sat back and we thought about the broader ESG and climate agenda. We we're very keen that we wanted to make commitments, both for our own operations and in terms of our financing portfolio. So in October last year, we launched our climate ambition statement. And as you correctly said, it will see us get to net zero for our own operations by 2030 and for our finance operations by 2050. Now, they are leading statements in terms of how they would position us versus the, the industry. And clearly, the goal is always going to be to get there sooner. So if I think of our own operations and maybe give a little bit of context, this is really a journey that we've been on since, I would say, um, 2012. We've had 600 initiatives running to reduce energy. And for a lot of the targets we set in terms of our employee emissions, we've actually beaten those targets. And now what we're doing is we're heading into the next wave or the next chapter. And to give a little bit of context and maybe unpack that a little bit for those watching, what we're looking to do is really operate under the greenhouse gas protocol and measures that are aligned to that protocol. So we're looking at scope one, scope two, and scope three emissions. So again, there it's really yeah our direct emissions, our indirect, um, and also upstream and downstream. I think linked to that, what we're looking to do is really simply, I guess, focus our efforts on, I would say, um, reducing replacing and removing um, certain forms of CO2 emissions that we have as a, as a bank. Okay, uh, I'm interested about the, uh, so the, the scope three um, ambition that you have. Uh, so being carbon neutral across the entire supply chain. Um, I'd like to, to ask you, uh, how are you measuring these emissions? Uh, not only yours, but those across your supply chain. Um, how do you collect the data? How do you make sure it is sound? And also, where do you where do you stop? How do you define the supply chain? Because I suppose in many industries now, you could speak of a, of a supply web rather than a supply chain. Yeah, it's a, great, it's a great point. And it's one that we face both as a bank directly and one as we support our customers as well. So maybe just to, to set a little bit of context again, it's a journey that we've been on with our suppliers over um, numerous years. And I guess measurement is a critical topic as we think about sustainability. And it's one of the key challenges for all businesses as they think about sustainability. It's an area where we've seen great advancement, but I think there's also some way to go. So let me maybe talk to three or four points, Matthew, that will, will answer your question. The first one is in terms of our current status. Um, and again, there are measures there that we use in terms of our status today, the CO2 that we, we emit, but also for our clients. And I guess one of the frameworks we look at there is PC, PCAF. And the second one is really around alignment. So 
for segments in the industry, for ourselves, how do we align um, to the uh, Paris Agreement, right? And again, there, there are measures that we use, such as PACTA, I would say, is one that people will be familiar with. Then the third area is really on verification. And again, we have to hold ourselves to account and our clients will be holding themselves to account as well. So how do we verify and validate that we're making the progress that we want to make? So again, here, it's very much to use, it's very much about using science-based metrics and the one that I would refer to as SBTI. And then engagement has a huge role to play as well as, I guess, a fourth axis. And for us, that's engaging with our employees. Um, it's engaging with our suppliers. And as we talk about our bro broader agenda, it's really all of the engagement measures we put in place with regard to our clients. And I think as we think about our own operations, Matthew, one of the things I would call out is this has become a critical subject and topic for our employees, but also for our suppliers as well. So it's one that you know, there's a lot of willingness to go on the journey. And as I say, to date, we've been not just meeting, but beating the targets that we have set as an organization in the space of um, energy usage, travel, waste, et cetera. Um, and I would say electricity is a, a good maybe opportunity to or a good um, point to look at. So, you know, we have said we want to, first of all, reduce our consumption of energy. Um, and there we're looking at reducing by 50 percent. And then where we can't reduce, what we'll do is we'll replace and, and replacing with um, renewable energy. And we have a goal to get to 100 percent renewable energy by 2030. And then if we um, can't replace, obviously the third ore is removed. And what we'll look to do there is, you know, high quality carbon offset um, as a last resort. Okay, that, that's, that's pretty clear. Um, I'd like to move on to your portfolio now, uh, where I suppose there are also some uh, really interesting questions to, to, to be asked. Um, so, so not only do you plan to, to bring your portfolio to net zero by 2050, uh, HSBC has also stated that they would work with their portfolio of customers to help them uh, progressively decarbonize. These are, these are your words. Um, it plans to provide between $750 billion uh, and $1 trillion in sustainability financing investment by 2030 to support companies as they switch to more sustainable ways of, of doing business. Um, I think the first question I'd like to ask about this is, is what net zero finance emission means exactly. So do you balance out emissions across your various borrowers, for example, in the portfolio? Um, and yeah. if so, how do you weight them? Is it you know, by assets, by loan volumes? How, how does it work, basically? Yeah, so it's really looking at um, a portfolio, taking a portfolio view, right? So one of the things we have been very clear as an organization in saying is that we want to help our, our clients and customers to transition. Um, what we feel we can't do is really shift responsibility for that transition to other institutions. So there's obviously, there are, there are always choices. The choice that we've made is to work with our clients. That is, we recognize a more difficult journey to, to go on. And we know that there are sectors, Matthew, that have to move faster. And it's really using some of the measures I referred to um, a couple of minutes back to assess the CO2 emissions of our clients, then getting that balanced view across the portfolio. So it's at a portfolio level. Um, what we will do as part of this is obviously increase transparency around reporting as well. And that's something that we've committed to as an organization. But more importantly, the opportunity to put capital to work for our clients. So one of the things that our clients have been really consistent in saying is this is a journey that they're on. 90% of customers that we spoke to as part of a recent Navigator survey have said that they recognize sustainability will be a key part of them building back stronger post the COVID pandemic. And 86% said they see sustainability as a way of growing their revenues and growing their sales. So our clients are really engaged. A lot of people worried that the pandemic would maybe lessen the focus on sustainability or would mean that the agenda would shift far from it. Actually, what we've seen is far more focus on sustainability with three in every four clients now setting targets themselves. 
Now, it's not for us, Matthew, as an organization to derive how best the client themselves transitions, right? So they need to decide on what that journey from a technology point of view, from a solution point of view looks like. But what we'll be working with them on is alignment strategies. So again, if you think of Pacta as a measure of how an industry is moving to get to net zero, we'll be working with them on their transition plan and then putting that 750 billion to a trillion dollars of capital to work in support of our clients. And again, we've been investing heavily in expertise to help our clients on that journey over the last number of years. Right. And how about then, the, I guess, the, the toughest sectors so where emissions are, are really hard to abate, uh, in particular fossil fuels? Uh, should you still lend to them? Um, do they need to have made certain pledges like we want to be net zero by a certain date? What's your approach? Yeah, so very, yeah, so very topical. So again, I think the higher polluting industries have always been a big area of focus. Um, and we've been clear that again, we want to work with those industries as an organization. I think we, we shouldn't forget the reliance on fossil fuels today, particularly in developing and, and high growth economies. But what I would say is, it's a topical question because we have a resolution that will be going in front of our AGM this year that will see us exit um, coal mining and coal-fired power plants and the financing of both by 2030 in Europe and OECD and 2040. So again, we've made a very bold statement in that regard. And then we're taking a sectoral approach. So what that means, Matthew, is we'll set short and medium term goals for all sectors. And that's something we're committed to do across this year and next year. And we'll start with those industries that need to move faster. So I mentioned coal, but also oil and gas, power and utilities and setting sector specific targets uh, for those for those um, industries as well. And when those targets are reached, do, do you mean you're going to uh, to change the way you, you lend to those companies? Are there you know incentive structures in place uh, to the companies you lend? Yeah, I, I think obviously the goal is that we want the clients to transition, right? And we want to be part of that transition journey. So the ideal case for us is clients commit to transition, they put steps in place to, to transition. We've got some great examples at a customer level of where we have incentivized businesses to transition. And in some cases, the customers have then in turn incentivized their own supply chains to transitions as well. And that's really a win-win scenario. If in the worst case, companies either refuse to transition or don't go on that journey, then obviously we have a, a choice to make, which could include walking away from those customers. But that's not our desired outcome. The desired outcome here is to help the, the business tr businesses transition, get them aligned to the Paris Agreement and to net zero, provide not just the capital, but also the expertise um, from a HSBC perspective to help them on that journey. And I would say we shouldn't underestimate the client appetite, Matthew, irrespective of sector, to go on this journey. So a couple of examples I would use maybe that are that are relevant. We have a client at the moment that's looking at um, an opportunity in the mineral space. And one of the things they have said with me said to me is they've spent as much time looking at their sustainability requirements if they were to enter that space as they have looking at the economics of the deal itself. Also, I think if I think of 12 months ago, the client meetings I was having clearly suggested that sustainability was very much top of mind on the agenda for our clients. 12 months on, they're now talking about the steps they're taking to transition. And again, we've seen some great examples around the world, one in Canada where you know, business was involved in the production of chemicals and CDs, and they've now shifted their technology to produce um, you know, solar capability. So there are more and more examples of businesses that are not just talking about sustainability, they're actually taking action. And I think that's really encouraging for all of us, just given the societal importance of sustainability and that much broader ESG agenda. 
Mm. That, that's really encouraging. And, and you, you, you clearly, clearly seem to think uh, and articulate really well that banks have a, a big role to play in this. Um, I'd like to ask you a question about uh, regulation and the role of regulators in, uh, in pushing this forward. Um, do you feel they are putting the right amount of pressure on, on banks, on the, the sector as a whole, uh, to ensure that their portfolio is sustainable and climate resilient? Uh, is it is it too little, too much, uh, just enough? Yeah, look, I, I think maybe first and foremost on the role of banks, I think it is very clear that private sector have a huge role to play in this journey and banks have a huge role to play in terms of making capital available to firms where there is significant expenditure that is going to be undertaken by firms to shift from carbon heavy to carbon neutral. So the banks have a massive role to play and it's widely acknowledged that public sector alone um, can't get us there and, and private sector has to work with public sector to, to get us there. In terms of your question on um, regulators, what we are seeing is regulators around the world are increasingly engaging on climate, on sustainability. We as an organization are very actively engaged with our regulators right around the world on this topic. And I think what we're seeing is you know, demonstrable shift in the agenda. So again, it's very much a top of agenda item for our regulators. And I think one area that I would call out, all the work we're doing in the area of climate um, risk stress testing. So looking at our portfolio, where our portfolio is um, more at risk, et cetera. And again, we expect and welcome um, you know, the, the focus that is being put by regulators around the world on this space. And again, I think, Matthew, what it's doing is it's increasing organizations' focus on sustainability, which is a good thing, and also bringing, I would say, far more transparency, which is also very important in the area of sustainability. Uh, I'd like to, to finish on the topic of emerging markets. Uh, so your chairman, Mark Tucker, has stated that Asia is arguably where the fight against climate change will be won or lost, uh, that, that is his word, uh, and one that uh, international sustainability standards established in the EU and the US may not uh, drive investment into emerging markets in Asia, where it's needed more for sustainable infrastructure. Again, this, this is a quote from him. Um, so HSBC is uh, is the global bank. Um, uh, in particular, it has a very sensible presence in emerging markets of Asia. Uh, so how are you working with clients there to facilitate the transition to net zero? Uh, and are there specific challenges uh, in this region? Yeah, so I, I think um, first and foremost, it, it, it's something that we recognize that you know, the um, Focus by emerging markets and certainly in Asia on sustainability is critically important. Uh, we welcome the commitment that's been made by China in terms of being net zero by 2060, but also seen other economies in Asia, um, Japan and Korea now make similar commitments. So see that very much as a positive. I think when we think of sustainability and ESG, it is one area where there's a lot of alignment across the US, EU and China, which again, Matthew, is a positive. It is going to be more difficult in emerging and high growth markets. And again, as a bank, that is a journey that we will have to support clients on. I think as we think about COP26 this year as well, the critical importance of policy frameworks the agreement of standards and um, metrics that are going to be put in place to assess the progress that we're making. Again, public sector investment to encourage companies to come along the journey. So all of those are critically important. And again, I think you know, we expect, based on everything we're seeing, that our clients in Asia and emerging markets are more than willing to play their part on this journey as well. Fantastic. Uh, thanks a lot, Barry. Unfortunately, this is all uh, we have time for today, uh, but it's been a, a fascinating discussion. So I'd like to thank you very much, Barry, for your time and insights. Um, and thanks you also to, to the audience uh, for joining us. Um, please stay tuned for the next panel, which is our keynote panel on unlocking investment for Net Zero. Uh, it comes next. Um, and in the meantime, goodbye.